My name is Jonathan Miller. I worked for three years as a software engineer at a car sharing company called ShareNow. Most recently, I've been elected as a Works Council Chair, which means I no longer do software development, but rather I focus on representing all of my colleagues in Berlin and the rest of the locations in Germany. When I was 17 years old, I was, I guess you could say, politically homeless, and I was living in New York City at the time. And down at Wall Street, there was this uprising, this movement called Occupy Wall Street, and I didn't know what it was, but I was interested. And ever since, it's been history. Five years ago, I was working at this uh, do good tech company. It was a company that supported do it yourself arts and crafts uh, called the Wanda. And it was a girl boss kind of company, majority women uh, employees, women CEO. And so I thought it was a perfect place to work for until it wasn't. And when I was collecting uh, salary data about the uh, salary disparities, uh, this was the moment where my boss, you know, came in shouting and uh, sent me home. And I was put on what's called garden leave in Germany, so I was continued to be paid. So in effect, I was given something like a paid vacation. But there and then I realized that this was a form of labor retaliation and they didn't want me to do what I was doing, which was collecting information on how much my coworkers were paying, even though this is the legal right of every employee in Germany. I wish solidarity was a daily reality rather than an aspiration. And when we look at the global value chain, I want every worker, every consumer to understand all parts of the chain. So what you're buying in a supermarket is not just uh, what labor went there in the supermarket, but went, went in industrial mining, in the shipping yards, in the uh, extraction of the natural resources. And all of this is intentionally obfuscated, so I wish this was more apparent. Knowing that we have this kind of impossible goal of changing the world, uh, it's important that we celebrate these smaller victories along the way. So even if we haven't completely transformed society, I know today and yesterday I have made a small difference in people's lives, and that keeps me going for tomorrow and the day after. The biggest obstacle is, you know, the people who say, I support you, I agree with you, but I don't have the time or I'm just disengaged. And so in one word, I would call that apathy, where people don't believe in themselves. They don't believe in, e in each other to make a difference. And so these are the hardest people because they're supportive on one hand, and yet they're very difficult to move over. Right now, corporations are operating on a global level, whereas many of the labor laws we're operating in are on a national level. And so uh, while you know, labor rights are playing uh, checkers, companies are playing chess, and so there's a lot of catching up to do. And I think we need to be much more flexible in terms of when we say corporation, company, employee, these have very precise legal meanings. Uh, but to the everyday person you talk to, uh, it should be more easy to just organize regardless of what legal arrangements you have. So whether you're a gig worker, whether you're working for a multinational company in an aviation or shipping yard, or whether you're a remote worker where the address of your company is in one place, or you're physically living is in another, there's a lot of catching up or simplification to do. So right now, uh, one of the biggest limitations when we look at the Works Constitution Act, the legislation for supporting the formation of works councils, uh, there are limits for employees with limited contracts. The duration of protection is not extended. So what many companies do is rather than firing uh, labor organizers, they simply wait for the contracts to expire. And coincidentally, they just decide not to rehire those people. So this is uh, one major problem. Another is when you talk about works councils, that's on the local level. But often what happens is you have different uh, separate legal entities in the same corporation. So in a company like Amazon, they have dozens of works councils, but because the corporation of Amazon is not headquartered in Germany, it's in Belgium and in Luxembourg, there is no right for each of the local works councils to organize as a group, as a group works council. So this is something that's obvious. Amazon takes advantage of it, and German legislators overnight could end this practice. This is something that even to every coworker in my company is super obvious. We're a car sharing company, so 
We operate both uh, electric vehicles as well as combustion engine vehicles. And um, the reason why we operate you know, all electrical vehicles in France is because you have regulation that um, provides subsidies, whereas in Germany we don't have the same level of subsidies. And so even to the most apolitical co-worker, this is something that's very obvious, that in order to address the needs of climate change, we need to have a just transition. There needs to be regulations and no car company uh, should be uh, competing with other car companies that have combustion engines. So if electrification is the goal, there's a long way to go. And if we don't want electric, if we don't want private vehicles altogether, then the entire sphere of urban mobility needs to change. So this is a multi-pronged problem, but it, it's at least very obvious to most of my coworkers. The one thing when I think about what every human on earth has in common is we all need to eat and the way we consume food has a lot of implications on the labor side, but also on the ecological side. And oftentimes the two are heavily pitted against each other. So when you talk about uh, meat production, it's on one hand very unenvironmental, but many countries around the world depend on cattle export. And so, um, you know, we can't just advocate for veganism or plant-based diets uh, without also thinking about the new jobs that people would have in agriculture or in produce? This is a really big question because on one hand, um, you know, being a very urban person myself, uh, we're by design not really meant to think too much about food or about food production. So it's a really good question. Um, you have companies like Infarm, which are advocating for on one hand green tick food, but just this week, you know, they also laid off half of the workers. So. Even if someone like me wanted to work in an area that I think could better the world, uh, that's also not possible if there aren't jobs to do it. And so the reason why I'm also not working on something that could make a difference is how do I sustain myself you know, from nine to five or what other job I work. And so here's the tension where on a very personal level, I'm not doing something because the economic, the personal economics of it don't necessarily make sense. You know, I'm not interested in myself being lionized as some icon or hero, and I'm also not interested in lionizing others, but I hope when people think of me or when they think about my legacy is that I was one of you know, hundreds of thousands of community labor organizers, people who sought to not just you know, make an outstanding change, but to also increase the capacity of others to believe in themselves and make a change. And so I think we need to think about these values without thinking so much about the individuals in them. Because the moment you start thinking about the individuals, it's very easy to reduce a movement to just one, two, three heroes. And then uh, when the powers that be don't want this anymore, they can just um, cut it there, both in the history and narration and also in actual organizing. So, you know, when I go home uh, from my work, uh, it doesn't mean I bring uh, or that the issues that I'm thinking about or that I'm passionate about stay at work. Uh, they also come home with me. And so I'm really appreciative to the people in my so-called private life uh, who've been incredibly generous and supportive, um, you know, especially when I'm having really bad days or when I'm really frustrated and kind of questioning everything. So in particular, I would want to thank uh, my partner, Barbara Orff, has been incredibly supportive of these years, as well as my mother, who has moved to the same city as me recently. Solidarity is not only in doing uh, what's necessarily in your own interest, but finding out that there's a common interest, not just between yourself, but also with other people. And sometimes this kind of solidarity is very easy. You know, when everyone bands together, they're stronger in a strike. But there's the other kind of solidarity, which is when your interests are at tensions with each other. So for example, at my company, we are dependent on an oil or uh, auto automotive economy. Having solidarity with ecological crisis requires some really tough conversations and contradictions to grapple with. That, I think, is one of the highest forms of solidarity one can aspire to.